Um, I'm David Duncan. I'm a, a partner solutions architecture manager, which means I'm on an alliance team, and I spend a lot of, of time working on uh, Red Hat solutions. Just uh, look a bit to the right. Sure. Oh, right yeah, yeah that's, 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 a, that's a sweet spot. Sorry. David Duncan, partner solutions architect. Uh, I work as a manager now, I guess, and, and uh, I've been working on Red Hat solutions on top of AWS. Uh, for the last uh, eight years, um, and before that, I uh, worked at Red Hat as a, as a software development engineer. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about machine learning ops, um, not because I want to spend a whole lot of time teaching you about ops, um, because I think that there's a, a fair amount of understanding of machine learning and um, or, I'm sorry, operations at Red Hat, right? I think almost every engineer here is participating in an operations uh, space. They're doing testing, they're doing build, build and test methodologies almost every day. Um, and I think that uh, there are some very important key understandings that uh, we have in design that are important for success. Like I said, um, I am an architect, and that's going to become painfully clear in the discussion points here. And I kind of put that up on the slides here to, to identify where where it is that you're going to see me, <laughs> uh, where you're going to see my talk, and where you're going to see the, the things that are associated here. Is that um, I put a lot of time and effort into determining where where there are target requirements, and then trying to figure out how we're going to build product uh, technology to to match those. Um, but I do that in the context of the cloud, and I think that the cloud is a very important part of machine learning. I think you know we've we've all been inundated with uh, with conversations around generative AI, or at least I have, and I think my team has been like sick of hearing the words generative AI uh, twice in, in one day, right? So, um, <clears throat> and I wanted to talk a lot more about designing for success and what key components are there, and how to kind of isolate what needs to be done, and maybe this will help you. Uh, as engineers or data scientists or data uh, um, or machine learning engineers um, or practitioners uh, to find a way to structure your ops and structure the, the configuration and then look at some of the tools that are available to you and I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll get into this in a little bit but, but um, um, my uh, experience has been one in which that design has led to productization and so I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about where those products landed and a little bit about how uh, that development, like the development cycles and, and, and what made that go. But uh, at Amazon, um, the, uh, at Amazon there's, a, uh, there's a, uh, a, a practice we call well arch architected. And uh, I was part of the team that designed this as well, um, but it's a big, big team, and this doesn't look very, very, uh, you know, clearly this is not a one-person job, right? So, um, in the early days, we were just trying to figure out how we would do uh, five pillars, or four. Sorry, we had four pillars when we started. We got five. Now there are six. Super exciting. Continues to grow, but I'm constantly looking at. Um, where things uh, focus in terms of operational excellence, in terms of cost, in terms of sustainability, how those, how all of that effort uh, comes together and where it goes through. And what we do uh, at Amazon that I really like, um, and I'm gonna get to some of the things that I really like about uh, the, the design principles at, at Red Hat too, so, uh, and, and in that open source community, um, especially around, um, uh, around open infrastructure, <clears throat> which we have some people who represent here in the front. Um, but, uh, but there is what we call the lens, and the lens is a way of actually taking those, the challenges that you, you face in uh, any one particular component of uh, your infrastructure development or, or your, your line of business, and really focusing down on the, the core decision uh, practices that make that happen. Um, on the Red Hat side, uh, I, what I really enjoy and, and what I've talked about a lot with, with other people who are involved in this, some of them were, who were on stage this morning for the keynote, like Steph and Brad, uh, are things like architectural decision records. 
and creating that infrastructure as code or, or the decision as code with uh, a certain amount of historicity uh, is an important part, component of what it is that you do in your operations. If you don't have that, uh, then you're doomed to repeat those same, those same decisions, right? And that is a very complex and, and complicated problem. So, um, sorry, I thought I had a little bit of a, of, of a pathway, but, but so wherever you land in, in the industry, like if you're in gaming, if you're in, um, if you're in, you know, if you're doing large scale databases, point of sale, uh, wherever you're collecting information from, pulling information from, doing whatever it is that you want to do, whether that's like some sort of uh, really basic recommendation engine or you need to do some sort of highly structured publicist group style uh, um, investigation of unstructured data that may take you in what, you know, whatever direction. Um, there are lots of places to start. Um, I personally started on the very far side of there in the HPC lens, and and the HPC lens was a place where we, you know, you you we created a structure for things that was very um, siloed, right? So you have a front end node. That front end node would would uh, uh, communicate chunks of simple chunks of data out to um, a a large scale group of nodes that were there to just crunch that data and return it to the front end node. And uh, we don't do that in machine learning, right? Machine learning is typically done in the same way that we do Hadoop uh, or in, in, a, in a way that is opportunistic now. And the opportunistic modes are some of the things that I think are really, um, really interesting and what it is that makes this happen, you know, what makes me excited about this and want to talk about it outside of uh, you know, my team. Um, so as you, as you build that structure, as you build that pathway, each one of these uh, ends up having a lens, right? You, you end up having a way to do this. In Red Hat, you have, um, there, there's a, a solutions um, collection, and each one of those solutions collections is pretty easy to, to sort of review. And, uh, and there are people <coughs> here uh, doing that research and, and people who are actually doing research in the university who, who are contributing to those in an open source way uh, that I highly recommend that you spend some time reading, right, and, and taking, taking some efforts there. And then also there's open infrastructure that you can participate in today um, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, to, to experiment and learn and uh, build out uh, structure and practice that's similar to what we were talking about uh, or what was being spoken about this morning in the keynote, um, which is that uh, open source software as a service. And machine learning itself uh, has a lot of component parts that uh, need to be um, extremely well documented, well understood. <coughs> And part of that is tools, part of that is finding out uh, what it is that we're doing in our documentation. And then some of it is just basically the paperwork, right, to get things done. Um, but ultimately, it comes together in, uh, in an operations model. Um, this is sort of the crux of what I think is really important for us, is that we have to figure out a way to ensure that we have a, a data processing model and then we need to ensure that we have a way to build a, uh, a continuous uh, cycle of this. I guess I could have done this in a circle, but I didn't. I mean, <laughs> and, um, uh, and you know, really the focus uh, that we have is kind of starts, for machine learning ops, kind of starts at collect data. You know, these other two, these other two components uh, are a really nice thing to have um, but they don't necessarily uh, fall straight into the operational models. Um, they usually this is this is uh, what you get handed as a, as an engineer and want to um, want to continue forward with. So I stuck with the uh, you know <laughs> I stuck with leaving that out. <laughs> We're not going to talk about business. I I can't do it. So <laughs> um, but I can talk about uh, but I can talk about what I think is the the continuous cycle here. Right, so I guess I did make a circle. Um, and I put it on this slide, not the one before it. Um, 
each one of these steps that goes into this process um, has to be clearly defined. And this is something that I think is really important, is that we find the parts of, these, of this structure um, in each one of the phases of the business so that you can, you, so that you can clearly define them. So I, I put in here that we were talking about this all the way to the edge. Um, I kind of thought about it backwards, which was all the way from visualization. <laughs> And all the way to the edge meant uh, trying to find ways to tune back into whatever it is that you're, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're, um, you're evaluating, right? Whether that's the hum of a giant tank of oil or, um, or the position of a series of ships. It doesn't really matter. Each one of these uh, component parts is really important. Anomaly detection was one of the things that I first worked on. And, and I think is, is a really important part of that edge computing uh, process. Like how do I get this data over here? Which data do I transfer? How important is it? What's, what, uh, what, is the, what is the clear path for doing that? So um, thinking about things from this perspective and listening to customers talk to me about this, I spent a lot of time trying to determine what, what, the, first, like, what the first component of this was gonna be. Um, so, um, a, a lot of that just came, came from like determining that models, most people were, were just looking for a model, right? Like they, they didn't, they weren't thinking to themselves, oh, I'm going to go make a model, right? They were like, I got one and I want to really implement this. And so if you don't, you know, if you don't know what it does and you just need to have something that, you know, that kind of, um, that, that works, you got to figure that out in, the, in this process. And this is like, this is messy, right? So this is not exactly where you want to have, you, well, this is not where you're doing ops. This is where you're trying to figure out whether or not you have a, you have a, a structure. And that is the first, that is, this is a, essentially the first part of, of your machine learning experience and not where you're thinking about how you're going to, you're going to tune, you're going to properly tune this configuration. Good news. Once you've done this a couple of times, you'll start to have an operational phase, and this part will look, a, you know, a lot like that little black dot in the middle, and you'll have an understanding of how it is that you're going to create all of these essential um, silos in which you can now start to create your um, your infrastructure um, your infrastructure model, and then your CI/CD pipelines and uh, how that configuration. Uh, comes together is really important and then this first phase the pilot phase becomes a lot less messy so for each one of the next iterations that you have now you have this machine learning ops kind of model and this is where you've already got the decision records you've already you already have all these things in place and you can start to you can start to um, you can start to push them into into play and <laughs> This is the great part about, uh, about this conversation that we're having here is that when you look at <laughs> how, you know, how much of this, of this effort is, actually goes into production, and these are kind of old numbers, but they're still consistent, right? Like I, did a little, <laughs> I did a little background checking and like, yeah, these are still, these are still good. The, you know, you're still not making a whole lot of, of um, of like you're making big decisions, you're doing a lot of you're doing a lot of transitioning from one model to the next to try and determine exactly what it is that you're gonna you know you're gonna get out of it. Um, and um, I have I have lots of, of fun stories about you know making those decisions, making changes in the model, retraining that model, and then and then determining whether or not that that the aspects of that uh, of that uh, determination were in fact valid. And explainability is like one of those things that is almost that's like guaranteed that you will have a lot of trouble in this space if you do not have already a process and a pipeline that makes it work. So um, I started, you know, I started off by, like I said, thinking about this in the context of this, and I'm highly opinionated. So I'm just going to tell you right now, like, like take this with a grain of salt. I am truly biased when it comes to, to what these operations look like in real life, like how they, how they in fact uh, get, structured, get structured, because I started from the, from, the, I mean, from the simple fact that I work on a team where 
the center of my universe is actually OpenShift, right? So I live, I live in a place like this. To me, is represents you know seven years of my life, like making making this a product and turning turning OpenShift into a service on on AWS was started off by uh, creating incremental changes that people could use uh, in the context of, of previous versions of OpenShift, right? This, this didn't appear for us until four, but on three, I wrote a scale-out model because the problem with the, with the operations for, uh, for building out a structure for cloud on, on OpenShift was that no one had thought about how the scale would work. So scaling out it was super easy. You just buy another node, and that was a, that was a fun you know a fun part of that experience. But then, like a very you know, deep pocket fun kind of experience. But but the but the goal was uh, I thought was to scale in right. Like I'm not using it today, so how far how far in can I scale? And uh, my favorite you know favorite uh, support question that I got from that you know the emergency support call that you get on GitHub. <laughs> Was uh, was um, was uh, from uh, from a customer who said, "I've scaled down to one node, and I don't seem to be able to scale back up." And I'm like, well, that is true. Um, Etcd is not going to let you do that anymore. And so, uh, and, and I'm sorry, <laughs> but good news. You have a CloudFormation template that will deploy it all over again, and you don't have to create the auto scaling groups that. Uh, are allowing you to do that scale in and scale out. Um, and I, we did that, so uh, um, the, the structure of that, the, the design we did was to create an auto scaling hook configuration, and the auto scaling hook configuration would do all of the node setup, and then when you wanted, when you wanted to scale down, the auto scaling uh, hooks allowed you to tear down the node in a proper way in the old OpenShift uh, uh, container platform model. And so this was the start of getting those people who were making the business decisions very excited about the fact that they had an incorporated model. Um, and, and so from, from the, as a foundational layer, that, that was the thing that created the excitement that made two business, uh, you know, decisions, one on the Red Hat side and one on the AWS side, that brought us a service that would, in fact, support doing a lot of that work. Now, um, everywhere you go, um, that product design started to become a really important part of how it is that we, um, uh, that we build the, the this concept of two platforms uh, talking to each other. Right, and in fact, integrated together. Being integrated together uh, means that you have to solve other problems on top of the problems that you have for just creating a container-based platform. Right, like we have many different selections. So now there's many different ways to deploy OpenShift on AWS now. Right, this is super. Suddenly you've got like you've got a big choice to make on how this is going to happen, who's going to manage it, what's going to be what's going to be going on, and and then you've got these other things that you can do, which are the vanilla, you know, the vanilla options. What, what, am, what am I getting myself into? Oh my gosh, now I've got a practice that has to make all these decisions. And that's where the decision records come in. It's like you can go back through those. You can make a you can you can make a single decision, and then you can make another one based on that. And in fact, there's some in the blueprints um, for the um, for the open infrastructure that talk about some of those like failures and the failed the failed decisions or the or the 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 advantage of one option over another in terms of like making a decision about one one open source project or a platform uh, component over another um, and then relating those back to best practice that's what those that well architected lens is for and and the components that uh, that you find in there start to Force, it's a forcing function to ask questions like, does this, is this sustainable? Does this you know, apply operational excellence? Am I getting scalability that I expected to get? So using those techniques and the technologies that are associated with that, 
that um, kind of question answer experience is a great way to form uh, that body. So take that, take the you know those six phases of the operations, and then look at how you're going to put that together, and you'll start to see that there's you know there are some places there are going to be some big holes. So uh, you need an inventory, right? You need an operational inventory, and so once once I started. Once I looked in and said, you know, we've got, you, you know, roses, roses like on the, you know, on the way. What else are we going to need? Well, it turns out that um, you need a way, you need a way to build out this infrastructure that is consistent uh, with your expectations. And and um, I, I mean, I chose Ansible. So an obvious choice, right? I'm, again. I'm in an alliance of steam. I know, I know, you know, I know puts, puts food on my table. But Ansible is also, you know, a personal favorite. I, mean, I can make the decision. I can make the decision for that outside of my experience, right? But there are some things that I think are important, and and they they are uh, they're supported by technology by by creating enthusiasm for that same same kind of technology. So. Identifying that that was something that was really important made me continue to talk to our cloud formation team and say, "Hey, <laughs> I really like what I can do with Ansible, and I don't like I don't like writing this JSON <laughs> target and and then uh, not being able to iterate very well or find find ways to do more minimal tests." Um, and uh, that team uh, <coughs> decided that they didn't like having just one way to do it and that they wanted to be able to incorporate that that strategy into what they were doing. And so that's that's how the cloud control API was born is out of that iteration, out of us talking back and forth and you know that that didn't just you know didn't just happen to Ansible, it happened because tools were changing, right? Chef was going away, puppets going away, nobody wants to use those anymore. The service mo the server model doesn't work for us. Um, and it certainly doesn't work for machine learning, and I'll get more into that uh, through this, you know, is that we were looking for kind of a, a, uh, an easy way to get um, research, to do the discovery for the resources to create um, a way of building out those best practices in, in an iterative model and also in a way that was easily consumable. So Ansible becomes kind of a, an easy place for us all to create opinionated uh, decisions. On the other hand, um, it it travels well. So it doesn't, so I don't need, like, you know, this is like just one aspect of it, and yes, this is like, this is David's opinionated inventory. I'm not, you know, when, when you get out to the edge, you, you're going to use different collections, you're going to use a different experience, there's going to be a different experience, but it's all going to be part of your execution environment. And <clears throat> And support infrastructure as code. So originally, there was nothing on there was nothing on AWS um, except the the uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. In fact, that was the only thing that was that ran on Amazon originally. In 2006, you could get a Red Hat box, right? That was it. And uh, once we started to look at what it was that we were doing with data. There were a lot of places for us to go with that, and some of the other things that came became kind of obvious was, well, we still need high availability, right? High availability configurations were absolutely necessary, and we still need a way to manage data at the edge. There are lots of times where you're collecting a lot of information, and you need to put that information into a, a large-scale um, uh, data lake. And, and we found that uh, there were some options that allowed us, you know, that Microsoft SQL allowed us to use in collecting that data at the edge, right? Like, made it very easy for us to have um, simple communications over VPN to collect small amounts of data, and then pass that data into buckets that were associated with with um, uh, with long-term storage, and uh, that. Has driven a lot of you know a lot of variation in our in the way that we use workloads. So, um, looking at kind of an example of how we build a pipeline, um, we start with 
you know, we start with the code, we start, that includes the infrastructure as code, and uh, the OpenShift kind of stays in the middle. In the early days of, of machine learning for data scientists and things like that, and people, people who were actually like crunching the, the, um, the actual algorithms and trying to determine whether or not they're fully functional, we have this, process, we have this um, uh, tool that they call the Deep Learning Army. And the Deep Learning Army is like a, uh, was exactly what I didn't want it to be. It was, <laughs> but it works, it seems to work, everybody loves it. It was a, a collection of basically every scientific library that you can think of uh, for Python, Ruby, and R that is uh, just like dumped into one uh, machine image with uh, all of the NVIDIA CUDA drivers and, and everything, and then you can just basically leverage that for, for, um, for component parts. But that doesn't make a pipeline, right? And so in this case, you know, this is outside of the pilot phase. These, these are some, kind of the things that you end up doing to get structured data. And uh, this represents for me uh, a data practitioner. So if you're looking at the way that this works, you'll see that I've got up in the, in the farther right corner uh, the, the concept of, of using Amazon Athena, which is, uh, um, which is a way of, of building out a SQL, SQL um, style uh, analysis of the contents of an S3 bucket. So if you have structured data or mildly structured data, you can create you can create a configuration and, and uh, get something back. And then AWS Glue is a way to create tokens and, and uh, to tag data so that it goes from an unstructured to a structured, more structured model. And <laughs> you can get those artifacts and get the trained model from that uh, from that experience, and then you can push that into production. So once you've got an approval, you know, your approval process to kind of transfer that over on the top. Once you have a, an approval process, you can move that over into your production cluster. That cluster can be, you know, can just, can come with you. And then, or I'm sorry, the, that, the artifacts can come with you. Your, your trained model can come with you. Your, um, you can pull the batch uh, inference in production data from there and then, uh, and then use that model in a way that is um, consistent with your business requirements, right? Your recommendation engine or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that, that whole process is exactly what I think of when we, you know, when we bring this, uh, when we bring this out uh, in, in uh, experience. And that's why there are tons of tools for doing this. There's, uh, you know, the single node out, uh, outpost is uh, an edge solution that we can use. We can use that in the context of uh, Greengrass. You can, in fact, for, for the AWS experience, right, we have, we have a, uh, a, small, uh, a small method for doing um, basically serverless functions at the edge, and you can collect that information and stick it into, into S3. Um, <clears throat> and then this becomes, this is the simplified way. As you become more, you know, as your data engineer uh, refines this more and more, you may find that the basic tools no longer work, and you'll have you'll create a more bespoke model that is consistent with um, building out on the Rosa experience, where the Open Data Hub tools will take you through that whole process. So um, that effectively is is everything that I have to talk about today, and then. To say that you know this is this is uh, a great opportunity to, um, to to talk about machine learning ops and what makes this work, and to see a little bit of an example of, of uh, from from an architecture point of view uh, what it looks like. Um, does anybody have uh, any questions? Uh, you briefly mentioned twenty twenty nine one of so, in your experience, how difficult was it to set up both the monitoring part and the model drift, like dealing with it, retraining? Like, how difficult was the whole cycle for you? Well, so um, for me, the I mean, model drift is is less of a concern because I, because obviously I'm more focused on operations than I am on the model the models themselves. But I, what I see from my friends <laughs> is that. Uh, because you're because the training is happening so consistently, um, when when you put 
when you put this into operation, like if you've got the Ansible models that are that are like building up the systems, and then you're doing your basic training, and then you've got that model in in uh, uh, in connection with your data. And I didn't mention public data sets, but public data sets are like a huge a huge help in in terms of training, and they come across as an S3 bucket. In fact. Um, uh, quite commonly, I will use those in the context of OpenShift, right? So I'll just grab that and then just put the assignment for the, for the public data set in in a uh, in an Open Data Hub uh, uh, workshop, workspace. So so those like building out that the YAML structure for that and and making it work um, reduces the amount of effort necessary for for retraining. Right, and so that's what I was talking about. Like the pilot phase is messy, and you will there there will be much gnashing of teeth while you while you try to push that back together, um, which is again why I don't like the machine learning. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> even though it's like it's incredibly reproducible because you just pick one and you just use it over and over again. But you know, if there's a security vulnerability or something, or if there's a modification that you really want to take advantage of, then you have to switch your entire environment. Right, <laughs> so. Um, yeah. Any other question? The yes, session is still running. I'm sorry. So, um, model serving is obviously a big part of uh, operating operating models. So, uh, the, all the inference part. A couple of years back, there was a myriad of young projects trying to solve that, um, starting from just wrapping in a Flask application and so then deployed as a container. Uh -huh. You had uh, TFSurf and um, some some other projects trying to solve that. I wonder if we now are converging to a more cohesive uh, and consistent deployment model when, when it comes to inference part, and maybe what is Amazon doing on their backends for all their AI services? Yeah. Um, is it always just homegrown, depending on the use case, or is there some convergence? I think there's a good well so. There is always an opinionated convergence. So if you looked at so if you look at Red Hat, um, I'll, I'll start right there. If you look, look at how Red Hat does this with the Open Data Hub, right? You have all the tools that are associated there, and then you have a way to to just generate, um, you know, I mean, the, the standardized structure is 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 to is to support the pilot phase in Jupyter notebooks, and then create that configuration and maintain those models in specific containers so that you can have that container space. But I don't know that, I don't, you know, at Amazon, the way to do that is they create SageMaker, then they use, they, use a, they use some very opinionated modules, and they say, you, Mr. Customer, can use all of these exactly the way that they, they exist today, or you can maybe later make a decision on how you're going to use it, like, you know, use a different one, interchange them. But in my opinion, you know, part of what we did, like building RHEL Workstation, on top of AWS was to create spaces where if you knew what you wanted to do in that messy phase, you could have immediate access to the, the right kind of hardware from a Red Hat instance or, you know, and you would know how to, I mean, and create an open source model so that you know how to build that on on other, you know, other platforms that you might want to use in your configuration. I think we're out of time. One more minute. Oh, okay, one more minute. Another question? <clears throat> so, so you do mention that uh, anthologization networks. So I've been using anthologization networks for a while. Uh, I wonder, is primarily intended for training the models, but do you have any sort of other studies that would the company that can achieve the whole? Well, I'm, okay. So, so talking about it from that, for, for the perspective of the Amazon products, yes. There. So SageMaker, I think, is really is really meant to leverage module models that are there. And then you have the ability to, to train, you know, to do some additional training on some of the extant models, models, and then you can add your own if you want to in a, in a, you know, in, in that in that process. Um, <coughs> there is what they call machine learning ops, which is a, basically a service for machine learning ops that that is available there for me. <coughs> Obviously, that's that's not where my work my work extends into into how I can make this work on the Red Hat Open Data Science model, which kind of gives you the same a similar kind of environment, but done in a very open source way and and a way that, that is uh, is um, uh, achievable on other platforms. 
right? So if you have a hybrid scenario and you want to have you want to have the same experience from from your on premises to your public cloud experience, then I would say you know you can do that in the in the context of the open data science for open data hub, and that the SageMaker would give you some sort of similar tools, right? In that sense, if I wanted to go go and build a cluster and then use Dask to you know to handle a, a, a complex problem across across a, a suite of, of systems, I can do that as easily in the context of an OpenShift cluster on AWS as I can uh, just I you know building that out in terms of machine learning <coughs> ops with SageMaker and, and the SageMaker and the SageMaker networks. Well, um, it was a very nice talk. Um, and if you have any further questions, I think you'll be more than, you know, glad to I'd be to excited to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> talk about it all day. <laughs>